All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the weekly wave. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm just going to jump right in. So I hope everyone's staying warm today, and um, here we go. Um, the accountability reporting, the enrollment graduation review, the close date on that has been extended to January 21st, so this Friday, well, I don't know. Yeah, this Friday it will close. And the, the toolkit is available at the link below. And please remember, if you have questions, email the accountability at sde.ok.gov. Um, the new transfer app, it is available currently. The form, the printable form is on the transfer page on the Oklahoma State Department of Education site. We're still working on the online form. Um, it should be available soon, but the, the date is still to be determined. Um, this year, we've given the superintendents till the 21st to enter your capacity. But ongoing, districts will have, um, will have a window each quarter to update their total and available, uh, available capacity. That window will start um, 15 days prior to the first day of the quarter and be extended to the 15th of the first month of the quarter. So keep that in mind. And your older transfers have been added to the app. So if you have any questions whatsoever, please contact the accreditation at sde.ok.gov on questions about the transfer app. Um, PEBT, and I'm gonna hand this over to Eric. Thank you, Nancy. So PEBT, um, phase one, phase two, and phase three are probably concepts that you guys may or may not know what that means. So I'm just gonna briefly cover what phase one, phase two, and phase three are. Uh, phase one was this, uh, a period of time where we were taking data directly from student information systems that got sent to us, um, translating that into um, a usable information to determine eligibility for PEBT. Um, where we, and phase one involved a, a bunch of students that we had the data correct, it was there. Um, it was right after rollover. So there was some data that was getting changed by your vendors. Um, by your by your um, agent the vendors agents um, because due to rollover it's just part of the process everybody knows that we struggle with that um, from time to time um, when we're doing rollover the agents sometimes send us delete messages and all sorts of things but the phase one was the stuff that was uh, accurate um, as as accurate as we knew um, all of us together you guys us uh, us together as well. Uh, we sent that data over to uh, DHS for processing. We had information based on your calendar, based on attendance uh, codes, based on um, enrollment codes that were, you know, the right ones that made sense that qualified a student for PEBT. Um, we sent that list over. There. It included about 330,000 students across the state. Um, that was the first, um, first PBT phase. Phase two, we're currently working on, basically it was another, uh, about 100,000 students uh, that we've, we thought should be included, um, but we have been working um, to correct data. And this was the data that uh, came from school districts that were, that are or were at least in 2021, um, either, or either uh, provision two, provision three, or community eligible programs that for some reason, uh, students weren't coded, uh, their free and reduced stat, uh, free and reduced uh, indicator was not coded as um, CEP or provision two or provision three, yet we knew that those sites were CEP provision two or provision three. Um, we went ahead and corrected that one thing, that's all we fixed was knowing that we knew that that site was CEP, we knew that that site was provision two, we knew that site was provision three. If they were enrolled in that site, we went ahead and changed them over to that free and reduced code and then uh, reran the logic behind determining if they were eligible for PDT 
and sent that over to D, uh, or we have not actually, we have not actually sent that over to DHS yet. We are validating the data currently to make sure that it makes sense with what we have in our um, system to make sure before we send it over to DHS. So that is very, very close. We're not quite there yet, but we're, that's very, very close. The phase three will start when our accountability reporting application, PEBT um, correction um, area is complete, uh, complete and out of development. That will look very much like a DVR process that you do not have to provide um, a bunch of documentation for. You'll just be able to look and see and make any data changes that you feel is, are necessary to reflect what, what was accurate in 2021 um, for those students. We will then send that data over to DHS. That is phase three. Um, now, I said that all really fast. So um, I'm making sure I want to briefly pause for any questions. Eric, I have a quick question. This is Terry from Choctaw. Sure. When phase one went through, you know, after the 2020 year ended and we got to briefly look at it all. We mm -hmm. downloaded it, looked at it. Yeah, we were mostly correct, but we saw several students that were there that were ac accurately accounted for. But now that the PUT report is open on our wave, mm -hmm. there are kids missing from that that shouldn't be missing. And parents have filled out the little form and DHS is telling them, sorry, if you're not on the, st the school's report, you don't get anything. And they were an RV on or RV off for the entire school year. So let me be very, very clear. I don't know. What, so it depends on who you get as a parent and when you call DHS, if you can get anyone on the phone at all. And I, I'm not going to sit here and throw DHS under the bus, but I want to be very clear. They are not done to issuing 2021 benefits. They are not complete issuing 2021 benefits. They will not be complete issuing 2021 benefits until after phase three has been completed, okay? They may be telling parents that they're not gonna get, uh, they may be telling parents that they're not gonna get any money, okay? Well, that may be factual for right this second because the DHS has no way to identify those students right now uh, they have no idea, way, no way to pay those students right now. They have no reason to pay those students right now. They, the people that answer the phone also probably don't know everything that's going on uh, behind the scenes. I am working directly with DHS's data team and directly with DHS's uh, CFO uh, and their CTO to ensure that every student that is eligible for PEBT receives the benefits that they are eligible for, for 2021. I promise that I will, there will be an opportunity. You will have an opportunity to go through and correct any data, change anything that needs to be changed to ensure that the students of your communities are, are, are determined eligible if they should have been determined eligible and receive that funding. We, we have not stopped and we will not stop until we've gotten through in this entire um, entire uh, process. So if you are getting calls from parents that are frustrated with DHS, trust me, I understand the sentiment. I work with them every day and I get frustrated with them. Um, we will not stop until every student gets that, that should be eligible gets their benefit. And I, I get all that, Eric. I, my main concern was should I be worried that kids that were right at phase one are not even listed on the report now? Or should I just uh, wait until it's completely done and then go back and make sure they're there? Yeah, let's let's wait through we get wait until we get through phase two and phase three, and then we'll then we'll worry about if if something someone didn't get paid and they should have got paid, then we, we'll make sure that they get they get that that funding. Okay. Don't worry awesome. about it quite yet. We're not there yet. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to correct that data in accountability reporting as soon as that application is built and developed. Okay, thanks, Eric. Yes, you're welcome. Please uh, convey to your parents, SDE and the local districts are doing everything and we will continue to do everything to make sure that they receive benefits if they were eligible to receive benefits. Um, if, as you get those, as you get those um, 
phone calls and concerns. And I mean, honestly, it's, 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 it's frustrating for a parent. Um, so hold on. Is there a way to get a list from, uh, of those from our district that may have been not been marked correctly? I could do that, but it'll be a lot easier for me to do that through the new uh, accountability application. Um, but because trying to develop 564 lists of students that may or may not have been marked correctly is a lot of work for one person to do and send out to you guys, especially um, doing that in some kind of unsecure way where when I find, when we get this accountability system built up, you'll, you'll just be able to see that. You'll, you'll be able to see that and adjust it as necessary. Uh, you'll be able to see exactly who was determined eligible, who was not, why they weren't. You'll be able to change the data if, you, if it's needed to be to make them deter, uh, determined eligible. Um, I mean, that is going to be a district um, reporting decision um, on the, in the accountability reporting tool. So um, where, why I could send out lists, it's, it's better just to be patient while we're developing this application so that you guys can make those changes. Um, when a parent submits a form on SDE for correction, will the district be notified? So what we are doing with that stuff, with that parent form data that we're receiving when parents um, submit their form, if it's a change of address, if it's a change of address and we can match it to a student, we have to be able to match it to a student. In a lot of cases, we're not getting STNs. We, we can't get a way to, uh, they'll use a slightly different name or we, but we do have a group of people that are going through and, and looking at those, all those parent form uh, issues. And if we can match it to a student, we will send all we have sent. We just sent a huge list of address changes to DHS directly. If it is not a DA, if it's not an address change, what, it, what we will be doing is incorporating that where you as a district can see what was submitted by the parent to say that we think as long as we can match it to a student, obviously we have to be able to match it to a student. That's why we request that STN to be submitted and some parents do and some parents don't. But if we can connect it to a student, you will see what the parent submitted on the behalf of that student uh, as you go through and make your decisions and make your changes to the data in the accountability reporting application. You should be able to see all of the parents' comments, uh, if, especially if it's not an address change. So you will be able to make that, that individual call for that student or your staff. Um, so phase three, just to correct, uh, phase three is just to correct 2021 or, or will it go to 21, 22? So no, phase one, two, and three are all for 2021. 21, 22, we haven't even started that fun project yet. We got to hit through 2021 before we can even look at 2021-22. Um, then that's a requirement from the Department of Agri Agriculture and Family Nutrition Services at the federal level. Parents being, parents being told by DHS they need a case number to check their PUD status. I, I don't even have case numbers. I have no, I don't think that that's true. Again, DHS is, I mean, I don't know if that's true or not, but DHS is um, not everybody at DHS, I think, is fully briefed on exactly what is going on with PBT. I think some of them are just people that answer phones and try to do the best they can to answer the questions. But honestly, some people don't know. They haven't they haven't been informed about it, so they're answering the best that they can. And you know, with people, when people get frustrated, it just it downhill from there. Um, is there a projected date for access to PBT and accountability? I I keep getting told we're, we're close. I, I haven't seen anything yet, so I, I don't know. So not at the current time, June, there's not current uh, projected date for PBT and accountability. Uh, we're gonna wait on transfer questions. Eric, uh, this is Chris from Oklahoma Virtual. Yes, sir. Well, we have a different problem. I'm not sure if you were addressing this previously. Uh, we've received some guidance, some unclear guidance at this point to stop marking our students as free or reduced lunch because we're not a meal offering to school. Um, but that would be different from how we've done it in the past because it was understood we don't, you know, we don't get PBT. Um, but we don't know how to mark those uh, correctly. Um, and it's generating wave errors if we call them anything other than, you know, Free reduced lunch, especially through direct certification. Do you have any guidance on that? So, 
we are working on the validation error. So if you get that error, that direct cert or economically disadvantaged doesn't match, or we're, we're working on those validation errors. However, virtual schools that do not serve lunches should report that they don't serve lunches for individual students. Um, that is at least my guidance from our CMP and accreditation office. So we, we're asking you to su submit that as a, I want to say it's none, I'll have to look up the code again, but I think none is do not, uh, not a uh, meal not offered um, is what that means. NA is. Yeah, because there's, uh, there's as many as five codes to put in using PowerSchool at least. Um, so if the one that translates to, I have to look it up. Um, let, me, let me look up real quick. Sorry, guys. It's virtual school, so it's causing problems. <laughs> Those friggin' virtual schools, you know how it works. Um, no. Uh, okay. Almost there. Chris, I think the lunch status override has to be marked as no access, but yeah. Eric can look at that for sure, in power school at least. So, okay, so it's NA. NA means refer, uh, refers to students who do not have access to a meal. So they're not getting meal. None is if they refuse. They are eligible, but they refuse. NA is that they don't have access to a meal. So you'll want to code them as NA. Thank you, Joe. I should have just looked what you were saying. Um, maybe save me a couple minutes. Um, just, uh, just to confirm, do schools, districts make any needed changes such as remote traditional days during phase three? Yes. You'll make any changes that you need. If it's a RV off that was coded as a resident all year and you realize, oh my, you know, Chris was a, and I'm making, I'm, I'm using Chris because we were just talking, but Chris um, was a, a virtual student and I just, man, I just missed that, that enrollment code. It's no big deal that you can change that. Uh, you'll be able to change that. If they're, if they just missed a couple of days due to COVID last year, and you coded the attendance incorrectly, no big deal, fix the attendance and we'll, we'll make sure that they get their, their benefit. Um, as it would be great if it can be disaggregated by site. Okay, so I thought I did that. If I haven't done that, and apparently I haven't, Barbara, and I apologize, uh, I will make sure that the report is disaggregated. It will, especially the accountability reporting app, it will be disaggregated by site for sure. Uh, that's just the way that's, that application's built. Um, the other report that's on the way for our single sign-on right now, I will go back into that and see if what I can do about making it uh, site-based. Unfortunately, I don't have full access. I can do some things, but I can't do everything. So I'll have to ask our developers to probably help me with the sites, but I thought mm -hmm. that on that first page, there was a, a sites way to disaggregate by site, but it's, if there's not, I will make sure that we, I, I'll, I'll try to get that done as quickly as possible. I don't, I don't know what would go into doing that. So give me, give me some time to figure out what's going on there. Okay. I'm going to move on from PBT. I think everybody knows what, what's going on uh, at least the best of my ability to tell you. And I'm gonna look at these questions about the transfer system. Um, first question is, will there be a Spanish form available? How does the wait list work? Okay, so that's a great question, Don. I will put that to Ryan Piper about the Spanish form. I don't see why we can't make a Spanish form. I think we probably can. I don't think there's any reason why we can't. Now I will say that the online parent form that is going to be on the website, um, fairly certain you can use a browser to translate it, but I think there may be, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say think, I'm just going to say that I, I know that you can use a browser to trans, uh, translate it, but on top of that, 
Um, yes, I will. I will look into seeing how we can get it translated into other and other languages, but Spanish being specifically requested for sure. Uh, how does the wait list work when a parent wants a specific school? Um, <clears throat> that is a local policy determination. If you, if a, if a, if I, we do, OSDE does not want to get into the the um, business of any further than we already have to by statute. If, if you guys, if your district decides that you can't pick a school and that's in the policy, you get to, that's up to your policy and your board and your, and your district. That is not an OSDE function. We're, we're already too far uh, into this, I think, um, dictated by statute. So I, I know for a fact that we do not want to get into the business of determining which site a student can or can't go to. Um, when, how do we cancel an open that doesn't complete enrollment or not in a seat on the first 10 days of school? Again, this is a local policy. You need to address these questions in your local policy. Your district really needs to consider these, these, um, these types of questions to include into the policy of how you will and won't um, accept transfer requests. Uh, Dick, it needs to, it needs to outline how many days, how many months, how many weeks, how many attempts, all those things need to be addressed in the policy of how transfers will work at your local district. Um, thank you, June. If you, if you could send that translated version, that would be very helpful. Um, there was another transfer system. On the new transfer system, should those students have the admission code of OT or open transfer? Uh, I would say yes. Um, I would say yes, they, they should. Um, of course, we run into the issue of out of home placement and, and other things that kind of kind of contradict that. But uh, for the most part, I would say in, in many, many situations, the answer to that question is yes. Open OT should be used as the basis of admission code for open transfers. I think that answers all the questions that I saw. Um, and I will hand it back over to Nancy. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> Just some housekeeping on the wave, our validation errors. They're still, um, we're still seeing validation errors out there. Please remember to work those. And if you need assistance in those, there are, um, there's a field in there that provides an explanation and also uh, CIF XML that can be provided to your vendor um, in order for them to help with um, resolving those. Also, SSO housekeeping, um, please be working your ownership wizard. Um, there's quite a few um, district ownership wizards out there, errors out there that need to be resolved. And we also, we're, we're assisting in helping with the STN wizard, but I'd ask you to please work those as well. So um, next slide would be, if you are setting up a new WAVE account, please be sure to email our OMES service desk at oms.ok.gov. They are the only ones that can create a new um, WAVE access for new employees. And that can take up to 24 hours for that access to show up. And always remember, if you have questions, you can email us at studentdataInfo at sde.ok.gov, or you can look up on the SDE website under um, sde.ok.gov, student information with documents and guides. Um, there's a lot of good information there as well. And do we have any more questions? Yeah, I've got, I'm going to grab, jump in here a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about the new, tra the, the new transfer system a little bit more. Okay. I wanted to wait until we got through the slides real quick, but um, there's a couple of new features in the new transfer system that we've released over the last couple of, uh, maybe a week or so. One of them is the statewide STN search. Okay. So you're going to have, uh, you're going to have this situation where, and, and at some point, if you stay at a district long enough, you're going to have this situation arise and you're going to want to know how to deal with it. You have a student that is currently attending your district on an open on, on just they live in your district right now. And um, 
next week they're going to move and they're going to move to a district down the road that's pretty close. They, they would like to rather, you know, they'd rather finish the school year um, in your district. And as a matter of fact, not only would they like to finish your, the, the year in the, in the district, they'll want to try to get a transfer for next year. It is perfectly okay for you guys, for them to go ahead and request a transfer for this year. And if they've got, if you've got room, which obviously you do because they're already in there, um, then you can accept that open transfer. Um, you can look up that student as basically what I'm going to say is the sending district should be their new resident district, even though they have never, this is a process, even though they've never enrolled in that new district and that new resident district, they're not attending that new resident district. That's okay. Uh, in these cases where it, where it makes sense, you can, they can go ahead and accept, uh, they can go ahead and uh, request a transfer. How you do that, and some, you know, this happens from time to time. I, I'm not saying this happens a lot, but it does happen from time to time. How you do that is you put your, the sending district as their new resident district and you as the receiving district. You go in and you'll look up the STN. The first time it'll you look it up in, in there, it looks against the district in which you're saying is the sending district and it's not going to find it. You're going you're gonna to look, it's not going to find it. Then you're going to hit the statewide search. There, when, you, when it fails to find it, that statewide search option will pop up. You'll have to have the STN but you type in the STN and it will find that student somewhere in the state, which will be at your school. That's it. We'll find it in our database that that's, it won't say it's your, your school because the STN is associated with the student, not the school. However, we're looking at local, we, to, to eliminate the issue of uh, latency and other issues of looking against the entire database for everybody. Every time you go in to look for a kid, we look at the school that you say is the sending district first. Then you can go through and look at the whole state. So if you have to, so that will allow you to find the student, but by, a, by doing the statewide search now, it's available right now. And then you can continue on with that transfer request. You do, I mean, so that is overcomable now. You don't, you will be able to find that. Eric, um, Eric. Yep. Sorry, this is Dina Rogers, but I have I do have a quick question on that because I'm actually sitting on two <laughs> right now who've moved to a neighboring district and would like to remain. <clears throat> the problem is, and, and I get what, because I've had the same thoughts, like they're already sitting here taking up a spot, right? So how does that affect your capacity? Well, I've got sites that are technically over what our capacity um, numbers are, you know what I'm saying? So like, like, for instance, one of these kids is a fifth grader at Wayland Box. Okay. Even if he like left the district right now, I will not add an extra spot in that capacity because the way our capacity is set, we had to allow room for growth, especially at schools like Wayland Bonds because they're not, you know, that area is not completely built in yet. So our capacity number is not the max number of the state requirements. It's set so that we still have enough space to take our move-ins without going over those max numbers. So, so am I breaking the law when I let him stay because he, because next if he does it if he doesn't do it now and he waits till if he puts in for 22 23 or whatever he, I really don't have room for him if if does that am I making sense him leaving does not create a spot bottom line hey him leaving doesn't create a spot that's that's a capacity question for you I mean I are you breaking the law by accepting him if you are um I, I, we were told in an accountability meeting with COSA hmm, last week or the other week, because it's run by a person from COSA and another person from COSA, and I don't know his title, was uh, sitting in there. And someone, I think it might have been Duncan, but I couldn't be mis, uh, speaking here. But anyway, so a district said, we have a principal who wants who their, their they're full based on their capacity, but they've had a request for a student in whatever grade. And um, that principal would still like to go ahead and take that kid. Is that okay? One person said, oh, yeah, well, that'd be fine. And then the other person wow. chimed in and said, COSA does not recommend that you do that because you're violating your own capacity policy at that point. I, so, would, say, I would say that I, I'm not going to, I can't, I cannot possibly answer I, that question. I figured you might not be able to, but I, I just wanted to 
kind of put that out there because if I just say, well, you know, Eric said he's he he's already in a spot. Even if he's gone, we're over our capacity limits. So uh, I'll, I'll direct that to our to a map. Yeah. Whether whether you fire. should or sh whether you should or should not accept them, I I'm, I can't answer. What okay. I'm saying is is the system now allows you to find the student so that you could if you chose to. Perfect. Thank you, sir. That's that's that, that's the that's what I'm trying to to. Okay. Thank you. Thank yep. you very much. Um, I would, yeah, I would definitely de defer to others uh, to make the should you, but the definitely can you, as far as the system, the system will allow you to. Um, the new parent online form um, obviously is coming uh, as quickly as we can get it out. Um, we, we believe it's going to be, um, we believe it's going to be um, pretty early February, if not really, really early February. Um, we're just finishing up the ability for um, that form to allow for parents to create, not parents really necessarily, but the form to create STNs uh, for students that have never had one. It will run through the exact same process as it always does <coughs> when you enroll a student in your student information system. Um, yes, we are aware of some of the issues that could be caused um, but um, we but we also know that this is probably the best way to to do it properly. Uh, so it would be no different. And the state is the one who will deal with the conflicts and the and the resolutions and all of that. So we will handle the, those those resolutions if it's created by the form. Um, that is coming soon. Um, I'm going to read some of these questions. If our district had a COVID closure that did not offer distance learning, do we need to code those specifically in our, our SIS? If you had a COVID closure and you did not do any distance learning, you should say that that is not an instructional day. So yes, in your SIS, you're, you should code that date as a non-instructional day. If your calendar says that it was, then it shouldn't. Um, and, and I hope, Andy, that I resent you that invite for the Teams group, so I hope that came to you. If it didn't, let me know. Um, follow up on Don's question. We have a policy for open transfer completion. We'll be able to, able to cancel a transfer in state reporting system if a parent does not complete enrollment or student does not attend according to our policy. Uh, so once you've accepted and approved or denied a transfer, that transfer is complete. That's what that system is meant to do. You accepted that transfer, if at some point after that, the parent doesn't meet the requirements of your local policy, that doesn't mean you need to cancel that transfer because you you went through and you did your part. We have documentation that you, that you did that. You would need to write something and keep something and retain some kind of record saying this parent, this student did not, did not meet the, the local policy of, uh, of, of completing a transfer, even though we approved. And that's why we are now not doing that is my my best solution for you my my suggestion to you to document that you that that was canceled due to you know according to your local policy and keep something like that on file um in case of an audit or any other questions that may come or or a uh what do you call it an appeal or whatever um i would also talk to your rao and your legal counsel about what you should do in that case I have a question about resolving validation errors. Uh, Amanda, when we get to there, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll holler at you, I'll, I'll, call you, I'll call you and you can tell me what your question is. I have, I have had access, I just lost it, it just jumped. I have had access to PBT report previously, but today I get the, I'm sorry, you do not have access. <laughs> so like, I'm, I'm sorry, you don't have access. Um, is there a link I'm not seeing? I'm not sure. Um, Jan, I'm going to take your name down and I'm going to look at your access and see if, if make sure you have access to that. And, uh, and if, if you do, and I'm just not, if you're not just seeing it, it may just be a computer issue. So let me, let me look and I'll send you a, a message a little later. Um, Required to make that change for students who move during the year, we go ahead and update the student's address so they will not be flagged as having a transfer for the upcoming year. What doing the transfer early, what doing transfer this year 
does is allows you at the end of the year to go ahead and approve it for next year if you choose to do so. That's what the system is, that's what it's built to do. It'll give you an option for every student that you have already approved this year for an unopened transfer. Um, it will give you the option to extend that, excuse me, in the next year. I thought it was going to cease, but apparently I'm not. Maybe I am. We'll see. Perhaps that, is, so um, I hope that answers your question. Um, Andy, do you need to code it 0849? I'd have to refresh my, my memory on 0849 for that, but um, I would say if it was just a day out of school, like there was no, no instruction, no professional development, no parent teacher conferences, no, 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 nothing, that's a 9999 as a weekend. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to check because, you know, we had a COVID code way back when COVID started that was like a, you know, we're not going to school and we're not providing instruction. Um, and so I put that one in, but then the wave kicked it back out. So I'll just mark it as a holiday like we normally do and just notate it. Yep. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I had some new transfers and when I put uh, input them online, it gave me the wrong grade for each child. I went in again the next day and it was correct. I had to cancel each of the wrong ones. Was that correct? Uh, if it worked for you, it worked for you. I'm, I'm glad it did. Uh, I don't know that, I don't know what in the world would have caused it to be the wrong grade, but maybe something else. Uh, maybe something in the data we received or maybe in something, um, I'm not, not real sure. So as long as it's working now, I'm happy that it's working now. If you see something like that in the, in the future, let me know so we can kind of try to dig into the, the problem as, as it's happening. <laughs> Um, all right, Amanda, back to you. What we got? Sorry about that. I took a call and missed my turn. Um, so you guys were just talking about resolving some of those validation errors. As you know, we're on eSchool and we run through our SIF agent. Mm -hmm. Um, so I am noticing that, um, what is erroring is all of our quote unquote present attendance codes. Um, the exit, the XML, and even the explanation um, that's given, it's, that's not how it's set up in our system. So when I talked to our SIF agent, um, <laughs> they were like, well, if we, if we send the data differently, you know, for you all, it's going to mess up, I guess, the adapter that they use for the Texas schools. I'm like, oh, good Lord. So all of our I guess the bottom line is that all of our errors do not seem to have any impact whatsoever on ASR, FQSR, like nothing else. And so I, I just didn't know if, if that's the case, is it something that I can just kind of turn and look the other way on? Or do I really, do you guys really want us to push that SIF agent to, to fix our adapter? Well, I'll never, you'll never hear me say, turn my, turn my head and look away from errors. But I will say this, I can, let me dig into looking at the actual, you know, look into the problem. Okay. And I, I'm sure you already did that, but I'm part of, you know, on your side, let me look at it on, my, on my side and see what I can do on my side. And then uh, if I need to reach out to Mizuni, I'll reach out and have, have that conversation with them. And then we'll, we'll figure something out. Okay. Do you want me to send you, Eric, just a screen capture of those those codes that are erroring? Erroring. Yeah. yeah, that would help. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yep. Um. Any other questions before? I think I got all the questions answered. I think so. Any other questions before we sign off for the day? Eric, I could stick around for a minute. This is Chris again with Oklahoma Virtual. I've got some questions about the open transfer um, app in terms of when it's going to open up again for us to, I think the terminology was extend um, the, uh, the existing transfers. Into next year? Uh-huh. That uh, right now, the current date, uh, that is May 1st, but this is a great uh, platform to say, does that work? Does that not work? Do you need it earlier than that? Do you need it later than that? What makes sense to you guys? Um, get some ideas of 
um, because May 1st was our was our initial thought. May 1st to June 30th, you can extend uh, your transfers into the following year. Uh, you got to be very careful with that, though. Um, you got to think through that. You, you never know how many people you're going to have moving in. You never know how many people you you know. So just just and if, once you accept a transfer, you've accepted it. So um, if you say yes, I'm accepting it for next year. I'm going to go ahead and give these kids a spot, and then you have 50 new kids move into third grade and in um, Wayland Bonds, and and I'm just giving you a little bit of a work there. Um, more but if you have 50 new kids moving to Wayland Bonds but you accepted you know 20 transfers into Wayland Bonds that's going to be a problem sure um as a virtual school since all of our matter. kids are transfers um we're, we're already beginning the planning process for re-registering students so I'll yep. know by May uh, the vast majority of our kids that are returning and definitely by June 30, I would have, uh, I'll know. So as far as I can tell that, that makes sense for us. Um, and it's certainly better than having, you know, a few thousand families reapply <laughs> through, through forms. Um, we were not looking forward to that prospect. Um, and then the bulk of our enrollment, and this is probably true for all the virtuals, comes um, basically right as school is beginning, you know, right before and even couple weeks into especially with COVID people kind of waiting out what schools are going to do so um any possible extension to that might be helpful but it'll be pretty much resolved by the end of June yeah so if we can I mean I, I guess my question for for the group is is um is May 1st early enough or do we need to move consider moving it back to you know April 15th or opening that window for um I, I hate to make it huge, uh, you know, even bigger, a uh, bigger window, but uh, at the same time, I, I want to do what makes sense for districts. I mean, you guys are the ones that are going to have to go in and, and accept those trans or, you know, basically accept those next year rollovers. Uh, if you choose to do that, um, you, you also can make the decision to not accept those. I mean, that's up, it's completely up to you uh, for the following year. You can choose to not accept them as, as you wish. Um, and make the district or make the, the parents re-request a transfer if that's if that's what you choose to do. Um, again, you know, be, and the reason why is because you never know exactly how many students may move into your district or move into your boundaries within, you know, over the summer uh, until you know. So um, again, that's totally, totally your op option. Like Eric, I went through all of ours when we, you know, we got an extra day off. So <laughs> I spent time, like I downloaded and looked through every transfer that was still currently in the transfer system and like cleaned up a couple of people or whatever. But I, because I, I coded them out on the infinite campus side based on the new law. So I wanted to know which transfer was actually a teacher's kid. I'm sorry, this is Dina from Moore, which one is just a which one falls under the military is the laws on those are, you know, it's different. And so um, I, I will tell you, you know, you brought up Waylon Bonds, by far the vast majority of ours are that we've accepted our teachers, kids, because we, we realistically don't have room to take on anybody that's not an automatic car. Right. I mean, we have some space, but, but very, very little. So even reevaluation for us is really just going to be a handful of kids that don't fall under foster care, military, or um, the teacher component. Right. And I, I got a question here from, from an individual as a private message. So I'm just going to read what it says, and then I'm going to try to clarify as much as I can. It said, I thought the law indicated that we could only deny an existing or previously approved transfer for the next year for only discipline or attendance. Is capacity a reason to deny the next school for the next school year? Let me be very clear. Okay. Let me be very clear. Okay. A transfer approval is for one year. A transfer approval is for one year. At the end of the year, a district can choose to automatically extend that if they choose to, or they can make a parent make parents reapply, make the parent, a parent, many parents, all parents reapply for next year for a transfer next year. Parents cannot do that in the system until July 1. Okay, parents cannot do that until July 1. So 
I am not saying you are not denying a transfer request into next year, this year. You are only not accepting a rollover from year to year. The parent has every right to go in and, uh, and uh, apply for a transfer for next year on July 1st or afterwards. And at that point, you could then determine if you have, uh, then you can determine if you want to uh, approve or deny based on attendance or discipline. Otherwise, if you do not have capacity, they could sit on the wait list or they can um, uh, choose to go somewhere else or many other, many other options that they have. But you're not denying a transfer based on capacity by not, by not accepting a, a year-to-year rollover. I think that that explains a parent can still apply for a transfer next year uh, on July 1st or afterwards. And you would have to deal with that as, as the student comes up in the queue. So Eric, on the ones that, if you don't do that, if, if we're, if we're on the assumption that they're all are automatic, unless as a district, based on your policy, you decide to terminate that transfer because of whatever reason, discipline, whatever. So if you're not gonna, if we don't make parents go back through that application process, really all that's on me as the district is if we've said, I'm sorry, thank you for coming, but your behavior was not acceptable, you'll go back to your home school. I just need to go into the I just need to go into the transfer system and put whatever that verbiage is about like revoked or what recent, whatever it canceled by the district. And everybody else just remains on a transfer unless they move in. Is that correct? Like that transfer stays in place and in, in the system until we go at in. The, at the end of the year, you will go student by student, transfer by transfer, and determine if they if you are going to accept or if you're going to uh, approve or deny the 2021-22 to 22-23 school year rollover for a transfer. So you're in, basically saying you got a list of all the transfers yeah. that have approved and you're going to say, parent, you don't have to fill out a new form. I'm going to go ahead and pro- approve your transfer for next year. I'm going to roll that approval over to next year. Your students been in our district are going to stay. We are, we are going to allow them to stay in our district, even though they're out of there. They do not reside in our district. You have that option. Okay. You also have the option to say, parent, we are going to deny the rollover. However, you may apply for a new transfer for next year on July 1, uh, 2021. Those are your two options. Oh, there's not no, can you give me an automatic rollover button and I can go hand change the other ones because they're all teachers. Kids. You're going to have an automatic rollover button okay. for every single student. It's going to say uh, approve or deny. Yeah, okay, but I can't do it in one foul swoop. Well, okay. I think, I think I, I haven't seen it yet because we're still, this still, okay in development. So I think we're still going to, um, well, I think it's a way to just click a select all and hit approve. So if, if you, we, that's what if, you choose. Okay, or, if, we, if we do that, because if we have two, I need to deny, then would it like, as you're developing it, my, my thought process would be, it'd be great for me to be able to go in and go, I'm denying kid A and I'm denying kid M. So deny, click off, done, whatever. And then the remaining students, I can auto roll up all in one foul swoop. That would be the greatest gift ever. That's 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 the goal. That's what how I've been awesome. explaining to it. That's how I've been explained it's going to work. But I, again, I have not seen it. So approve selected students, deny selected students, kind of like that. Yeah. That's the idea. But whether you accept or deny or approve or deny is completely a decision for the district. You do not, the law does not state that you have to automatically approve everyone for a rollover or deny everybody for a rollover. That is 100% a district decision. But again, the parents would have every right to request another transfer next year if it were if that automatic rollover was denied so that automatic magic button kelly thank you for asking 
that question. That automatic magic button will appear on May 1. That's why I was asking you guys if you if that timeline was enough because you only have a window of July, May 1 to June 30th to, to do that automatic rollover. And I, that's why I was kind of bringing that up. That magic button, that magic list where you can collect, click a select all and then go through and say, well, actually, I just, I don't want row B and row M I want, I'm going to uncheck those and I'm going to prove the selected students I've already selected, which is everybody other than those two. And then I'm going to go back and click those two and hit deny the selected and be done. Um, at least that's how I've been explained. Okay. Um, Angela votes to open a rollover window earlier than May 1st. I, I saw that. Okay. And we will, I, I, I have, we have said something this to this effect to our accreditation. Uh, right now, the, the, the FAQ that's coming out very soon on the transfer system uh, and all the rules and all the way it works and all the questions you guys have all the time, that's coming out really, really soon. We've been working on it pretty in depth for several, several days, several weeks, actually. Um, right now, that's going to say May 1st. Um, again, that may change. Uh, it's not, that's not that date yet is to be locked in stone. Um, so I will talk, I will continue those conversations with our accreditation department to see if, if uh, our RAOs and they, and they feel like, cause this is really their system uh, from a programmatic point of view, but um, see if they agree that we should mo maybe open that earlier, uh, closer to April 15th or so. If there are no more questions, or if there are, we're going to go ahead and stop the recording. So Nancy, if you'll stop that. Um,